Welcome in, everybody, to Fantasy Pros. This is the Fantasy Football Podcast. It is me, Joey P., Joe P. Zapia, and today we got a great show for you, as always. We're going to talk about some expert consensus rankings that don't match up with our guests. We're going to get to some headlines and your questions. That's right. We are the People's Podcast. Therefore, you ask us questions, we will answer them. Kyle Yates is here with me today. And, of course, Derek Brown, the man from FTN who does all the DFS. He also works for me in the Fantasy Black Book. Very excited to have him on the show, especially with that glorious beard he's rocking today. Derek Brown, it is good to see you again, my friend. Welcome back to Fantasy Pros. Joe, Kyle, what's going on, guys? It's been a minute. Uh, We're standing at the precipice of week one. I'm excited, man. Thank you all for having me back. And I got to tell you, I don't know if it's mental or not, Yates, but it is the 1st of September And I just felt like taking a deep breath and going, oh, it's September. I know it's just a date on the calendar that we're just kind of crossing off. But mindset wise, I felt really good about the fact that we are now out of August. I am done with August. I am ready for September. I'm ready for kids to go back to school. I am ready for football to start. (laughs) And I am absolutely 100% ready to get to games that matter. I don't know what it is about today, but I mean, the weather dipped into the 50s here uh, in Michigan and so overnight. And so uh, it's going to be back up into like the 70s today. But that just waking up today, it just felt like football weather. It just felt Mm. like it is time for some football. We are getting close to it. So, man, we are we're I'm starting to prepare for week one. I'm starting to get my week one article ready. Like we are here. I was actually last night. You'll appreciate this, uh, boys. I was at the. uh... The flag football coaches meeting. We had the draft last night for the all girls league. Uh, It's very exciting. We got uh, 27 girls, I think 28 girls in the league. Very cool stuff, man. And I can't wait to get out on the field and start coaching. I got to tell you, man, this is kind of like just pump me up even more for football season as if I wasn't excited enough. We'll get to the headlines. We'll get to Derek Brown's ECR differences in a moment. But before we do, I know this is probably the biggest draft weekend that you could possibly imagine coming up. And you do not want to go in there without the draft assistant with Sync. If you go right now to fantasypros.com slash draft wizard, again, this is very easy. Draft assistant with Sync. If you still don't understand what it means, basically it plugs into your draft, right? This software, whether you're drafting on Yahoo, ESPN, NFL, CBS, it doesn't matter where you're drafting. All that matters is we're going to be with you. The draft assistant syncs up to your draft, gives you pick insights, gives you uh, news on who's going, where, where you should take this player, where you can wait. It's absolutely incredible. It's like having one of us in the draft with you, or actually a collection of us, really, especially we can use all the other cool features that are available. But you can only get it if you're an MVP or Hall of Fame subscriber to Fantasy Pros. And I know what you're going to say. Joe, how do I become that? And how do I do it in a cheap, economical way? Well, Uncle Joe's got you again. If you go to fantasypros.com slash offers, all you got to do is make a $10 deposit on one of our partner sites. That's Yahoo Daily Fantasy, Underdog, FanDuel, and DraftKings. You're going to be playing fantasy anyway. You take 10 bucks, you put it in one of the partner sites, and guess what? Guess what? Six free months of our Hall of Fame package of Fantasy Pros. That's a $65 value for 10 bucks, six free months. You get the draft assistant with Sync. You get the Hall of Fame membership for the whole season of the NFL. I don't know what's better than that, so please go to fantasypros.com slash offers, get it done for 10 bucks, then go get the draft assistant with sync at fantasypros.com slash draft wizard. Make your life easier. Help us help you. That's what we want to do here in the family that is fantasy pros. So obviously yesterday, big cut down day, lots of news, lots of things floating around there. And uh, we'll start with a couple of these. We're just going to go through some ones that uh, might affect some of your deeper league rosters. The Raiders released John Brown. The Rams waived uh, Xavier Jones, which was not shocking, but a little surprising. Uh, the Chargers waived Tyron Johnson. I want to stop there. Yates, this was a guy you talked yeah. quite a bit about. I guess Josh Palmer kind of balled out enough in the preseason to make Johnson expendable. Do you think he catches on somewhere else? I do think so, because Tyron Johnson's actually a really good football player. I mean, was highly efficient last year in his role. And you talk about Josh Palmer. Josh Palmer was going to make the roster no matter what, because he is the eventual replacement for Mike Williams in this offense. He's going to be that. He's going to play that role. 
once Mike Williams moves on next year in free agency, most likely, right? The guy who was surprising because the two guys that battle for this field stretching role in this Los Angeles Chargers offense are Jalen Guyton and Tyron Johnson. Mm -hmm. I would have bet significant money that it would have been Tyron Johnson as the guy to take that role this year. However, it looks like Jalen Guyton sticks on the roster and he's going to be the guy to play that role. So I'm not going crazy about Josh Palmer. People are saying that it's Josh Palmer season on Twitter and stuff like that. No, it's not. You've got Mike Williams still here. Mm -hmm. If Mike Williams misses time this year with an injury, then it will be Josh Palmer's season, but he's not going to step into that field stretching role in this offense. That will be Jalen Guyton. So if you want to take in a dynasty league, you want to take a deep shot on someone, uh, Jalen Guyton is the guy to do it. However, I am still watching where Tyron Johnson ends up because I do think that he can fill that role with another offense. All right, let's keep on with some of the other headlines here. The Vikings acquired Chris Herndon from the Jets. Uh, Debro, you brought up the uh, tight ends for the Black Book this year. Any uh, any thoughts on this move? Obviously, with Irv Smith missing the opening of the season, it gives him some depth at the position there. And does this mean all the Tyler Croft now? Is that what we're looking for in New York? I mean, it could be all of the none of the above. Oh, I mean, it's <laughs> it's it's bad. It, look, I, I I've talked about Herndon. I've written him up over at FTN Fantasy before. He's flashed. I think it's just time for us to cut bait, move on. I mean, mm -hmm. look, I, put it this way, guys. I understand that the Vikings needed tight end depth, but if you can't stick in the New York Jets tight end room, if you can't beat out Tyler Croft, then we got some problems here. And we don't need to be hyping a guy because another team traded for him when he couldn't even beat out Tyler Croft, of all people. <laughs> so, I mean, let's let's pump the brakes here before we talk about Chris, Chris Herndon's season. I, we need to pump the brakes and understand that New York didn't even want him. So just because Minnesota did, it's not that great. I, I think it's amazing how some players just, they always have upside for every. Like, what is it about some guys that the fantasy football community just refuses to go, no, that's, that guy's a bust. Like, no, no, this is the year. This is the breakout. This is, oh, this is the change of scenery. Gates, why let's does that look in the uh, Let's look in the crystal ball, guys. 2025, we're still going to be talking about Chris Herndon, uh, no matter what team he's on, as a potential breakout. <laughs> Oh, no, it is it is very possible. Also, uh, the Patriots put uh, all-pro quarterback Stephon Gilmore on the reserve pup list, so they will not have him uh, for the opening of the season. And something else happened in New England yesterday. Yates, I can't remember what it is. Uh, something happened. Do you, you want to talk about whatever <laughs> that was? All right, here we go. All right. <laughs> Joe, well done, my friend. <laughs> oh, well on. done no. on this call. I'm just what? breaking your chops. Here, Here's the funny thing. And, and I said this on Twitter, I'm going to say it again here on the show. Our job is to be right. And it's not an easy job. We're trying to constantly put order onto chaos. Every time a football is is hiked in the NFL, the amount of outcomes that could happen on any given play is stunning. We sit here all the time trying to give an order to chaos throughout an entire season with projections, with projectable. Our job is to be right. It is hard. Hopefully we are right more often than not. That's what the work that we're trying to do. But if anything here, like Yates and I, like I want to give Yates a hard time as a joke. It, this is our job, all right? And, and now we're on to the next thing to try to be right about. But right. more importantly, Yates, from the Patriots standpoint here, this does certainly change the dynamic of the offense with Mac Jones as quarterback week one. Oh, I mean, it completely changes the entire offense uh, as far as the offensive structure. And it gives a lot of boost to the receiving options here because Cam Newton as the quarterback, you know, we – with Cam Newton as the quarterback, it was like, okay, well, Cam's going to be valuable for fantasy football as long as he's starting because he runs the football and mm -hmm. he's going to be utilized around the goal line. That was the value for Cam Newton, but it dinged the rest of the options in this offense. You had Damian Harris, who wasn't going to see any goal line work, you know, so he was kind of, he had a cap on his fantasy football output. And then you had the, a lower passing volume offense because you were going to be running the ball so much. Now with Mac Jones, we know that like he's not going to be running the football. So you're going to see more pass, uh, a more pass heavy offense here in new England, which boosts John New Smith, Hunter Henry, Jacoby Myers, guys like this. It brings Damian Harris up slightly just a little bit, because but he's still got Ramondre Stevenson on this roster to worry about around mm -hmm. the goal line. James white, JJ Taylor all here. This is good news for the receiving options and the fantasy football options in this offense. It does not necessarily mean that Mac Jones is now suddenly a no. mid-range QB2, right? Because no. he his limited rushing upside just plays a role here. This is not it's still not an offense that is going to be like prolific. So he's gonna get the job done, but it's not gonna be something where we say Mac Jones is a locked and loaded mid-range QB2 and you can play him any given week. Like he's gonna be have some weeks where he's plugged in as a streamer, but that's pretty much it. 
I think that it certainly uh, spreads the touchdown equity around in a very exciting way from a fantasy perspective, where a lot of it was controlled theoretically by Cam Newton. But Debro, what are your thoughts on this? Because this kind of surprised everybody more to the point, I think, that he got released, Cam Newton, yeah. than necessarily. And, and maybe that's part of it too, Debro, because like, here you are. Do you want another situation where Fitzpatrick, the veteran, is looming over Tua and all that? Meant you, you, if you're going to do it, just pull the Band-Aid off and do it, right? I agree. I mean, I think that this is where you're you're saying, okay, we don't want somebody breathing down his back. Like, he needs to sit here and be like, we're going to go all in. He's the guy. And that's what the statement says. I mean, because I think Cam Newton could still be a serviceable end of a quarterback. We, we could talk about that for days. But the fact of it is, is that this is a team saying, okay, he played well. He showed that he could be efficient in this offense. And he showed growth over the entire preseason. I mean, if you look at yards per attempt, you look at accuracy when he was on the field in the preseason... Mac Jones performed better and better and better every single week. And this is still going to be a red zone. Like, when they get into the red zone, this team is going to run. They did that with Tom mm -hmm. Brady. They're going to do that with Mac Jones. And so I think that we're talking about how this offensive design looks like. They can baby Mac Jones for the first, like, part of the season and ease him in behind a top three offensive line, a good rushing attack, and a defense that's going to bounce back because – they, yeah. they added players in the offseason, and they're going to be healthier outside of Gilmore. Yeah, uh, and look, in those deeper leagues too, Stevenson, Taylor become very interesting as well. I think Taylor's going to get a lot more run than people realize in that offense. He's like a he's like a stronger Deion Lewis kind of version. Just just be on the lookout. Like, there's going to be some games, I know it's frustrating with the Patriots' backfield historically, but certainly from Damian Harris' point of view too, especially early drafters when you got him as an RB4, that's an immediate value now that's really shot up into that high RB3 range, if not more. And that's where he was going before. So certainly a difference maker there. Also, I saw PFF graded uh, Mac Jones preseason almost as high as uh, Patrick Mahomes from a couple years ago. The, the highest graded quarterback preseason in a while. And granted, he had more opportunity, and that's what you do with some of these rookies. You try to, you know, <clears throat> get them more play so they start to look confident. But still, that is encouraging at the very least for the fantasy investments that we've made in some of those wide receivers and those running backs so let's get to the arguments here so we're going to give you some guys that d bro is higher and lower when it comes to ecr the running backs the wide receivers the quarterbacks the tight ends etc etc and then we're going to go to our good friend mr kyle yates and he is going to agree disagree give his two cents maybe three cents we'll see how it goes but uh, d bro let's start here with the running backs and let's start with a running back that you are higher on than the ECR. Well, one of the guys that's got to make the list here is Clyde edwards I, I love him for this season. He is, and I, I look, when I looked at ECR, I'm like, okay, I get he's a mid-range RB2. I have him as a top 10 back this year. Hmm. I think that he is going to absolutely ball out the offensive line. Everybody knows the upgrades there. But you're also looking at an Andy Reid offense last year, finished with the third lowest running back touchdowns ever for Andy Reid. Touchdowns are coming back to this backfield. The offensive line is going to be improved. And the things that we wanted to see out of Clyde edwards Lair in the rookie season, the guy played 13 games and he was still 11th in routes run. So the pass game involvement is going to be there. No, I'm not worried about Darrell Williams. No, I'm not worried about dead legs, Jarek McKinnon. <laughs> not worried about them. Clyde edwards Lair is elusive. He's going to play well. And the ankle, it seems like, is not as big of a concern as what we were hearing in preseason, whether it was what type of injury it was, he's back at practice. So I think it's it's wheels up for Edwards Alaire. Now Edwards Alaire in half PPR in the ECR is a running back fourteen. Yeah, it's, here's a question for you: With Jonathan Taylor right now in that situation going on with the quarterbacks, first you had Carson Wentz hurt. Now he's on the COVID to start the year. It seems like a lot of flux going on right now with the Colts. Would you feel more comfortable with Taylor or Clyde Edwards Alaire on your roster? Because Debro's basically putting them very close together. Sure. I've still got Jonathan Taylor ahead of Clyde edwards Uh Carson Wentz, yes, he did land on the COVID-19 reserve list, but as long as he tests negative, uh, he'll be back before the start of the season. So I'm not super concerned about it. Now, it doesn't necessarily bode well that he hasn't been in training camp and hasn't really developed a ton of chemistry with the with the rest of the offense there. But CEH is one of these guys that is so difficult to project. And Derek's taking a little bit of a leap of faith here. He's putting his stamp on it, which I love, right? It just He's putting his foot down and he's saying, this is my guy that I'm going to rank higher than ECR because I have belief in what he can do. CEH, from an opportunity standpoint, he's in the best offense in the league. So yes, you think that this running back is absolutely going to be fantasy football relevant. The issue that I have with ranking him at that point 
is last year, yes, he had a significant opportunity in the red zone, 23 rush attempts, right? But the issue is with his size and skill set, 23 rush attempts inside the red zone, only one rushing touchdown mm -hmm. inside the 20. So he's got to be this guy. He's not going to bowl anyone over, right? He's not a Derrick Henry. He's not even a Jonathan Taylor in the red zone. So he's got to see his workload in the receiving game tick up. And yes, the opportunity is there. Again, it, everything is pointing that it can be there, but can he execute? Is he going to get the opportunities? With Patrick Mahomes, we know that when he scrambles, which is so fantastic at, he's going to push the ball deep downfield. He's not looking for that check down. If CEH were paired with like an Alex Smith at quarterback like J.D. McKissick was last year, then goodness gracious, we would see CEH with 120 targets on the year, and he'd be a top 10 running back, top five maybe, because he's so talented as a receiver. So I just don't, the opportunity is there. Can he execute? I love taking CEH as my RB2 in yeah. fantasy this year. He's one of these guys that has the range of outcomes to push into not only the top 10 where Derek has him, but the top five because of the opportunity and the offense that he's in. But there is still a low floor here, right? There's a little bit of a lower floor with CEH because what happens if he doesn't execute on that opportunity? Well, the good news is he's going as an RB2. So yep. this weekend when you're in your drafts, make sure you go take him as such because I agree with the boys. There's upside there that you want to build in especially if you do settle in with a very steady running back to start. Let's get to another running back that you are higher on than the ECR here, Debro. So the other guy that sticks out to me is James Conner. And I, I get that everybody loves Chase Edmonds. We've seen Chase Edmonds garner volume in spurts. The problem that I have and the reason that I'm higher on James Conner is, one, James Conner was not as bad as everybody thinks he was last year. Behind literally the worst offensive line in the NFL based off of on-paper metrics, 13th in breakaway run rate, 14th in evaded tackles. So James Conner is not this dusty, has-been, terrible running back that like maybe he's framed as. And I understand he's sitting at RB34 in ECR. I have him a shade higher than that because I think the touchdown equity is going to be massive for him in this offense. We've never seen Arizona use Chase Edmonds inside the five. And Kenyon Drake was top three in inside the five rushing attempts last year. We've seen James Conner be good. I think that James Conner, like... Where you're going to get him in drafts, and if he falls in a lot of drafts that you have coming up this week, he has massive touchdown equity inside of this offense. Yes, Kyler's going to factor in. I'm not worried about Chase Edmonds having the goal line role because size, history, Arizona has never shown that they're willing to give him that. So that is even more of a projection where people have Chase Edmonds over where we're going to sit here and talk about James Conner at. Yeah, uh, it's funny because I'm not an Edmonds guy. And a lot of it has to do with the lack of potential goal line opportunities between Kyler Murray and James Conner. And as Conner begins to dip more and more, Gates, do you see opportunity here, especially when you are looking in the half or even standard leagues, that Conner can be a useful play? Yeah, for sure. The concern becomes, does Kyler Murray become the goal line back again? And does <laughs> right. he take away those opportunities from what was Kenyon Drake last year? And then, and Drake saw an uptick because Murray was banged up, right? So then now does that play into this year with James Conner? I do agree that he's going to be the back that's in, in uh, on the formation inside the 10. Like it's going to be James Conner over Chase Edmonds. They're not going to bring Edmonds onto the field. And I am lower than Edmund, on Edmonds because I think that he just doesn't have the touchdown upside that a lot of these other backs in that range are going. With guys like Cam Akers, J.K. Dobbins, Travis Etienne, them all going down, we're starting to see these, like, like you got to field the running backs on your fantasy football roster. Like, it's getting, it's getting thin out here. So James Conner is one of these guys that I don't want to draft. Like, I don't want to draft James Conner. Uh, I agree that I think he's still a, a good fantasy football running back. I think he's still a good running back. But the durability, is that a, that's a concern here, too. I don't want to draft James Conner, but at this point, as an RB3 on my roster, to be able to just have a steady Eddie kind of guy that I can plug in on bye weeks and a guy that I feel like is going to, I know what I'm going to get. I don't have that with a lot of the other guys in this range. So I think I can definitely see where I don't want to draft James Conner, but at this point, he's one of these guys that you might have to. We did a 14 team draft yesterday for your fantasy pros in our in house league. And let me tell you, Running back is very dangerous. It gets dry real quick. It is a, a nasty area, which is why, like, we talked about Stevenson before. We talked even about, you know, guys like Taylor. You're going to be looking for these guys in those 14-team leagues because we've had injuries already to a few guys ahead of uh, who we thought was going to be there, with J.K. Dobbins especially. That was another huge blow uh, to that to that running back group that was already hurting a little bit. All right, Derek Brown, let's continue with your wide receivers. Give me a wide receiver you are higher on than ECR. 
So, this is not, I'm not saying this is egregious, but I have this situation flipped. <laughs> I don't understand, like, I feel like this is just recency bias. And, and this is not me hating on this player, because I have him ranked very aggressively because I love this passing attack. I don't understand why we have Robert Woods over Cooper Cup. Like, I love, Ooh, love Robert Woods. This is Woods. gonna be a beautiful moment but coming I up have, next. I have Cooper Cup over Robert Woods. And before Yates comes in here, and I feel like he's <laughs> he's primed and ready to sit here and shoot me down with Robert Woods' love, it's not because I don't like Robert Woods. But with Cooper Cup, this is a guy over the last two seasons. He has more red zone targets than Woods, 30 to 20. Besides last year, you look over the two previous seasons. Cup was wide receiver 7 and 15. Woods was wide receiver 12 and 16 in fantasy points per game. You even look in deeper metrics. Yards per route run. Cup bested him in that last year. So we're talking about red zone. We're talking about efficiency. And we're talking about before 2020, he was the better fantasy option. And people are drafting Robert Woods over Cooper Cup. And I, I don't get it. Like, I've got Cooper Cup as a wide receiver one. And people might say, like, that's insane. And I'm like, this is a guy in 2019 that showed us he's going to get you 1,100 yards and double-digit touchdown upside. And we love Matthew Stafford for this year. I don't understand why we don't love Cooper Cup more. This is why I love you, because it's always great to, to come out here with a new opinion, a different opinion than maybe some of our listeners have heard, because we have been very pro-Robert Woods here, and it's good to hear a difference of opinion, especially one that's backed up with some facts. So, Yates, I assume you're going to take the Robert Woods defense here, because clearly that's that's got to be where we're going with this. But Mr. Brown does make some really good points about Cooper Cup. Listen, I have Robert Woods over Cooper Cup. This is not something that I'm going to fight him on because literally in my projections, I have Robert Woods uh, and Cooper Cup separated by three fantasy points. So mm -hmm. like they are neck and neck and there is a difference. There is a gap there in ECR and ADP. I think with the concern with Cooper Cup is that from 2019, we saw his red zone targets drop from 21 all the way to seven last year. Now the quarterback play can certainly play a role in that, right? With Jared Goff and I mean, Jared Goff is, that's a whole other conversation. So <laughs> Matthew Stafford coming into town, right? I think that we are going to see this offense take off. I have no issue whatsoever with drafting Cooper Cup as a wide receiver too on my roster because not only does Robert Woods have top five upside this year, but I believe that Cooper Cup does as well. It's going to be fascinating to see how that all pans out with Stafford. All right, let's get another one of your wide receivers. You're higher on than ECR, D-Bro. This comes down to, yes, I, I, I love J Jalen Hurts. Everybody knows that I love Jalen Hurts, and Jalen Hurts is a better passer than everybody thinks. Devonta Smith is going too low. Like, he is wide receiver 39 in ECR right now. I think that his ceiling is massive this year. For, for all the things that people talk about with Philadelphia, we haven't talked enough about the fact that, like, yes, Nick Sirianni's there. Yes, he's going to have a hand in the offense. Also, Shane Steichen coming over from the Chargers and all the things we saw with Justin Herbert in L.A., that also needs to be played into here. We don't think the defense is going to be good. And we've seen under Steichen, like, they feature... Keenan Allen's target share was redonkulous last year. Like, it was insane. And Devonta Smith, if we think that he has the talent to be that guy, to be the guy that we saw at Alabama, his target share could eclipse. Like, he could literally, and I don't want to sound like I'm being hyperbolic, but he could be the most productive rookie fantasy wide receiver this season. And I know everybody's down on Chase, and this is not me throwing shade at Chase at all. I think that we're not high enough on Devonta Smith and his target share upside in this offense, in an offense that I think the quarterback play is going to be better than people give it credit for. Because if you go back and you look at Jalen Hurts as a college passer, he was immensely better than people will ever discuss with him. And this offense, the pace could surprise, and they're going to throw more than I think people realize. They might have to if their defense keeps playing the way they have in the preseason because they have mm -hmm. not been good, that's for sure. There's a fascinating cluster here in ECR, Yates, where it's Smith, it's Antonio Brown, LaVisca Chenault, Corey Davis. Those are some of our favorite things, I feel like, on the show. Yeah. There's a lot of value in this range, but I'm kind of with Debro that it does feel like we're, you know, talking so much about Chase underwhelming in preseason, but not enough about Devontae Smith and his upside. It seems like he is kind of a second-class citizen right now. It's so funny. There's the the tier of wide receiver, low end wide receiver two, high end wide receiver threes in ECR, or I'm sorry, in ADP right now, where you've got guys like Kenny Galladay, Jamar Chase, like Corton Sutton's in that range. Like all those guys, I want to take that cluster, move them down, 
and then move this other cluster with guys like LaVisca here, here. Chanel, Antonio Brown, yes. and maybe even Devontae Smith falling into that category and move them up, right? Because I do think that there is more upside with a lot of these other guys, Jalen Waddle falling into that category too, uh, than Kenny Galladay. Like, I don't want Kenny Galladay on my roster, and I have to, <laughs> <laughs> I have to reach uh, in that range to be able to get one of these wide receivers that I want on my roster. With Devontae Smith, I... I definitely see the upside because from a talent perspective, Devontae Smith is just ridiculously talented. Uh, he's already shown that in his limited action in the preseason. Like we, He's going to be fine in the NFL, and he's going to be good. Excuse me. He's going to be good in the NFL. It depends on what side of the Jalen Hurts argument that you fall on. I am on the side where I do not agree that Jalen Hurts is a better passer than people think. I, I think that I have, going back from his tape at Alabama, Oklahoma, there's enough there to signal that he he has to progress a ton as a passer to be able to sustain fantasy value for not only guys like Zach Ertz and Dallas Goddard, but then Devontae Smith, and to be able to give them fantasy value. He, for Devontae Smith, I think that he's going to have a significant target share in this offense, but it comes down to the touchdown upside. Is he going to be? Is he going to finish with more than six touchdowns on the year? I think that that's what he's got to see to be able to push up into the top 30 to the top 36 at the wide receiver position. I just don't know if I can see that happening. Hertz is a player I wish we saw a lot more of in the preseason because I think yeah. it would have helped a lot of our evaluations for those of us who still have questions. And I got to say, I'm kind of with Yates, especially as a QB1. I have lots of questions there. I don't even want to get into that. Maybe later we will. We'll see. Give me another wide receiver, Debro, that you think uh, is uh, you're higher on than ECR. I, I mean, I, I guess I'm just going to stay on the rookie train here. Why is Terrace Marshall down at wide receiver 71? Like, why? Like, I, 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 like, I, I don't understand it. Like, we're, we're, we're leaving him for dead in ECR? Like, well, I can only assume maybe it just has to do with target share in the offense. Like, how many, how many guys can be productive? I, that's the argument I'm going to throw out there. But I don't necessarily buy into that, that he can, you know, be 71 either. That he's that useless necessarily. I mean, I, I, this is an offense last year that we saw be bottom three in pace. So the pace comes up, as well as they still supported, with Teddy Bridgewater under center, three thir top 36 options in fantasy. You're right. Yes, I understand Dan Arnold's back. Yes, I understand Christian McCaffrey's there. Christian McCaffrey had a similar target share to Mike Davis. So if we're projecting more targets for Christian McCaffrey in this offense... Uh, based off of when we saw Christian McCaffrey on the field, that's I mean that's still taking a leap that he's going to have a higher target share than he even had when he was on the field last year. Terrace Marshall is going to be a matchup nightmare. They're lining him up in the slot 65% of the time in the preseason. We've seen every single time he's been on the field in the preseason, and I understand it's preseason, he is bullying corners. He's being used in the red zone. I love him this year. Like, I think that he is a viable wide receiver four. I have him ranked as such over at FTN Fantasy. So, if, and you could still get him in best ball drafts right now that you're doing. He's in the wide receiver 50s and 60s. Like, I don't understand it, but I'm going to just continue to draft more Terrace Marshall. Uh, Yates, you've seen a lot of film, obviously, study in, on Terrace Marshall. Do you think that there's more opportunity than people realize for him? So with Terrace Marshall, I had him a little bit lower in my pre-draft wide receiver rankings because I thought that there was a, he was a boom or bust prospect. Like mm -hmm. the, the boom is, I mean, potentially top 12 wide receiver in the NFL. Like he has the skill set, but he was a little bit raw as a route runner. You didn't see a refined route tree from him uh, and then struggled with drops occasionally throughout his time at LSU. So I think with, he definitely, from what we have seen in the preseason, he is progressing nicely like he is coming in and he is showing that he is a dominant dominant talent at the wide receiver position now when you take that and then you switch it over to the fantasy football conversation you say okay where do the targets come from right as far as consistency can he finish the season higher than wide receiver 71 or wherever you said he was going to bro like yes absolutely because he's going to have some big performances here or there but as the fourth target in this offense you are taking a massive leap of faith and betting on sam darnold being a lot better than what we have seen for him to sustain fantasy value for Christian McCaffrey, DJ Moore, Robbie Anderson, and then Terrace Marshall and Dan Arnold. Ian Thomas was top 10 in routes run at the tight end position last year. So they brought in Dan Arnold in free agency. He's going to be on the field. He's going to be running routes. So, and San Darnold has favored the tight end position before. So it's just, is he going to see enough targets to provide consistent weekly fantasy value where you feel comfortable putting him into your lineup as a flex option? As a solid bench option, I like it because he does come with tremendous upside if we were to see Robbie Anderson or DJ Moore miss time with an injury. So that's just the concern. Can he finish higher than wide receiver 71? Absolutely, because he's going to have some big performances. But he's one of these guys that I think fits best in best ball formats rather than weekly redraft.
Derek Brown, give me the quarterback you are higher on than ACR. Oh, I mean, we're staying in Philly. It's Jalen Hurts. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm planting a flag. I'm there on it. I looked through all of his passing numbers all through college. He's a guy that progressed as a passer in college. And the, the one nugget I want to give here is that looking at his adjusted completion rates, you go back through his, la- his final season in college, and this is a sample size looking at all different levels of the field. As a deep passer, intermediate, and short area adjusted completion rates. These are sample sizes of 140 quarterbacks or more in each one of these. He was top 20 in adjusted completion rate in all levels of the field. So I think that the small sample size that we saw last year in a broken offense on a broken team is not what we're going to see this year. All of the camp reports for Jalen Hurts have been absolutely like just glittering. Like, whether it's, okay, yes, he's finally named the starting quarterback in Philly. But, like, the camp <laughs> reports, <laughs> oh, that was that was insane. People are like, what about Joe Flacco? And I'm like, I'm like what about Joe Flacco? Shut up, shut up about Joe Flacco. And what about Gardner Minshew? And I'm yeah. like, okay. Well, he's been I mean, there he's for gotta... 48 hours. What are you, crazy? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 it's just, it's one reason to fade Jalen Hurts after another. And even in joint practices, which Sirianni was, like, back and forth, like, consistently, like, I care more about joint practices right now and us showing wrinkles of our offense than in the preseason. He was, there were beat reports even coming out of like Patriots camp where they were like, Jalen Hurts was by far the best quarterback on the field. And this is not me saying this. These are reporters watching these two teams play in joint practices. So I have him ranked as a top 12 quarterback. I have actually inside my top 10. I think the rushing upside is there and all the other things that I talked about Devonta Smith I mean, if I like Jalen Hurts, then Devonta Smith is going to be the spear, man. Like he is going to be the number one option mm-hmm. in this passing attack, and I'm 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 in for it. I think both of them are great values. And and actually, Jalen Rager's had a few moments in preseason mm-hmm. that I thought were encouraging. Which in some of those deeper leagues where he's just floating around late, I've actually taken a share or two for the first time, which was a player I, I never thought I would have one single share of, let alone two. But let me frame this in a different way for you, Yates, because we've already talked about Jalen Hurts. I feel right. like ad nauseum, but. As a QB1 in a single quarterback league, is he a good investment in that sense? Because now that you, you know, you're looking at the board, you see these rookie quarterbacks who are getting opportunities. You see Lawrence look really good in that last preseason game. Is this an opportunity now to take the upside of Hurts, either balance it again with a, a simple Kirk Cousins or Matt Ryan or with a Fields or yeah. with a Lance or somebody like that? Is that actually a better strategy than wasting a pick in the middle of quarterback on a guy maybe like an Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, so my whole argument this entire offseason has been that there is a lower floor with Jalen Hurts than a lot of people are acknowledging. And so when his ADP was like QB8, QB7, I was saying like, yeah, that was this is way, this is crazy. Like we, we can't let him go ahead of guys like Ryan Tannehill, who's proven that he can get the job done, not only just as a passer, and now he has Julio Jones, but then also with his rushing upside, right? Uh, seven rushing touchdowns last year for Ryan Tannehill. So my entire thing is that I don't think that he should go ahead of Matthew Stafford, Ryan Tannehill, guys like that at the back end of QB1. At QB12, which is where I have him ranked, he is worth taking the shot on because if he doesn't pan out, if he doesn't take that next step as a passer, if defenses don't limit him as uh, as a scrambler, right, which is where the majority of his fantasy production came last year, then you've got a, you know, if they, if they don't do that, then you've got a top five fantasy football quarterback. Like, if not, then you've got a very, very low floor and a guy that you can just cut to your to your waiver wire and just move on from, right? So I think, yes, at that point, at QB 12, QB 11, wherever you want to frame that, in that range, stack him with a Trey Lance, a Justin Fields, one of these guys that comes with tremendous upside who we see is going to be starting sooner rather than later. I think that is a really, really smart strategy this year. All right, Derek Brown, let us get to your tight end. Actually, you know, let's do the higher and the low. Let's do both the tight ends here, kind of get them out of the way. Give me the tight end that you're higher on and the tight end that you're lower on than ECR. So the guy that I'm higher on, and we talked about running backs and it falling off a cliff really fast, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, I like these options, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, what happened? Where, where'd they go? That is the tight end position, and once you get outside that top five, top six, I mean, you can make so many different cases for guys in that like 8 to 12 range, and Cole Komet is a guy that I'm going to plant my flag on this year. Love him this year because... I think the opportunity is massive based off of what we saw for Chicago last year. Weeks 1 through 11 before they got Mitch Trubisky back under center and decided we're going to hide him at all costs. We're going to run. We're not going to let you throw the ball unless we absolutely have to. 
Weeks 1 through 11, this is a team that was first in red zone passing rate. You had the dusty corpse of Jimmy Graham, who was top five in all of the NFL in red zone targets. Yep. That's the opportunity that stands in front of Cole Komet, who ran, who played all the snaps with the first team in the preseason, coming off in a hamstring injury. I love him this year. I think his upside is massive for his role in this offense. And flipping over to the guy that I, I don't get it. Like, I, it, it doesn't make any sense to me. How do we have Noah Fant as a top 10 tight end when last year without Cortland Sutton competing with Jerry Judy and then KJ Hamler, he didn't even put up top 10 production in that scenario. Yes, he was efficient, but he wasn't top 10. And now we have him inside the top seven. I, I don't understand that for a team that I think Denver is going to run, 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 run. Oh, hey, let's uh, sit down for a play and take a timeout. Run, 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 and run the ball some more. I think that's going to be the entire thesis of this offense this year. So I, I don't understand how we have Noah Fant that high. And I'll just take later shots on Cole Komet. Yates, yeah, everyone's heard me talk about Cole Komet for months now, but it looks like you and Debro have made up and you're friends again after the Robert Woods <laughs> incident and the Jalen Hurts uh, innuendo. Then uh, Noah Fant, obviously another player where I think we all think he's a top 10 talent. It's just, right. is he a top 10 yep. fantasy tight end? And those are two different questions. They are two very different questions. And I felt so bad because every single player that Derek has brought up are just happened to be the guys that I'm like lower on. So I feel like I'm pushing back and being a jerk this on this is, podcast. But, no, it's, but it's good combos. This right. is healthy. Good too combos. many podcasts hold hands the entire time. They're like, oh, this is the nice way to play. Let's all agree. And it's like those product like those conversations are not as productive as people being yep. like, No! You're crazy! Like, what, sure. what, what are you talking about? As long like, as you're I crazy, you back it up. You can't just yes. be crazy on a feeling. Right. You can't be hooked on a feeling and try to change people's <laughs> minds. You have to be hooked into some data and some stats and even some visuals that you can back it up with. And and Yates, I mean, those are the two questions when it comes down to Fant. And, and I think, I don't know about you, Yates, I've been doing, and, and now this is something that's new for me. I've been reaching a little bit for Kyle Pitts lately. Because I'm starting, not because of the one catch he had, but I'm starting to look at that tight end board and I'm going, well, what if he is that transcendent guy? And he's still mm -hmm. in a place where it's still very cheap and it's amazing how cheap he has stayed. Have you found yourself, just out of curiosity, starting to add some Kyle Pitts, even in mock drafts, just to see what the teams look like? No, because in that range, he's still going in like the fifth or sixth <laughs> round. And that's where I'm looking to take advantage of the running back okay. board before it just completely goes goes to uh, hell. So I think with, uh, yeah, with Kyle Pitts, he's not one of those guys that I'm reaching. And then once we get past, I mean, once we get past George Kittle, Darren Waller, right at that two, three turn, I'm waiting and I'm grabbing Tyler Higby or John New Smith later on, because with guys like Noah Fant, Dallas Goddard, who are tight end seven, tight end eight in ECR, like in that range and ADP, it just makes zero sense. Why would you waste a roster spot for a tight end who does not have the path for significant targets in this offense, right? When you do have guys like Horton Sutton, Jerry Judy for an offense that does figure to be predominantly run heavy with the investment in Javante Williams. I, I just don't see it happening. And it's not like Noah Fant has been a crazy touchdown producer either throughout his short NFL career, three receiving touchdowns, each of his two first seasons. So it's not like he's going to suddenly vault his way into the top seven because of he's finishing with six or seven passing touchdowns. That's taking a, like you're betting on Teddy Bridgewater being a lot better than he is. I think Noah Fant's being drafted above his ceiling. It makes zero sense to me. You know, it's funny. It's just real quick going back to the Pitts conversation. What I've been able to do is if I get Pitts in a mock or even in a regular draft, remember that grouping of wide receivers we were just talking about boys where it was, mm -hmm. it, was mm -hmm. it was Corey Davis, it was Antonio Brown. I've been able to get usually two of them because they tend right. to go later. And then that's when people start panicking because they're looking at running back. And that is, again, something to consider the evolution of the draft board as we get closer and closer to the start of the season. It looks very different than it did August 1st than it does on September yeah. 1st. Let's yeah. get to some running backs that Derek Brown is lower than on ECR. We put all the tight ends out to pasture. That's done. Let's get back to the running backs and let's talk about give me the two guys for you, Debro, that you are lower on than ECR. So one is James Robinson, and my biggest concerns with James Robinson and because of the preseason action, yes, I understand ETN's unfortunate injury kind of narrows the field for Jacksonville, their usage of the running back position. We're going to see more Carlos Hyde than anybody wants to see this season. It's going to happen. We saw it in the preseason. James Robinson played 50% of the snaps with the first team. Carlos Hyde was out there for 42%. They ran similar routes, saw similar workloads. So... I don't have any faith that Urban Urban Meyer is going to be a really good NFL coach. 
um, considering that he is willing to inject this much Carlos Hyde into an NFL offense at this stage. So I, I can't draft James Robinson as a top 20 running back. Like, is he top 25? Is he top 27 where you want to put him in that range? Because we talked about it falls off quick. That's fine. But I think we're going to see a ton more Carlos Hyde than anybody wants to see this year. And the other guy, and this it's similar similar backfields and similar diagrams, but different teams. And that's Josh Jacobs. Like, he's going at RB20. I can't draft him there. I have him lower in my rankings because, again, you can say whatever you want about Kenyon Drake. But the other part about this is that John Gruden is going to do whatever the heck he wants. He's going to <laughs> inject Kenyon Drake into this backfield. He's going to be used. They paid him as such. And regardless of efficiency and what have you, the offensive line is not going to be amazing this year. It is definitely downgraded. And if we see a lot more Kenyon Drake and these other two running backs in these depth charts eat into the production of these guys that are going well inside the top 20, top 24, it's a hard pass. I'm just going to take wide receivers at every single spot and I'm going to rank these guys lower because when people head over to our rankings, you're either higher or lower on guys, and it's like, okay, well, where am I at versus consensus? I want you reaching for guys, or I want you to be above consensus on certain players or behind it, because that's how you're going to attack your drafts and how you're going to sit here and draft your teams. And these are two guys I will be f fine being behind consensus, because I want you taking wide receivers in those spots. Yates, whenever I see Carlos Hyde, I, I just think of Nick from New Girl and say, this is my nightmare. <laughs> that's that's what it is. Like, it, And you're right. I mean, he touches on that. You're going to maybe see more Carlos Hyde than you want. It could be frustrating. What are your thoughts on Robinson and Josh Jacobs here, uh, where Derek has them according uh, yeah. as opposite to the ECR? Yeah, watching the preseason game for the Jacksonville Jaguars, I was like, there's no, no, they're not going to do it. They're not going to do it. They're not going to bring Carlos Hyde in around the goal line as much as they're showing here. They're not going to do that, right? And then you look at projections and you're like, I really should bake this into my projections because it scares the hell out of me. Uh, so James Robinson, I think, is still a very safe RB2. I think he's going to have volume. I think he's going to get the opportunity around the goal line. But Derek's absolutely right that we're going to see Carlos Hyde way more in this offense than we should. Uh, so I think James Robinson is one of those guys that I'm still fine drafting him where he's going. But he's one of those guys that we can't get too carried away. We can't view him as a top 15 running back or anything like that. we got to pump the brakes on him because of Carlos Hyde and Urban Meyer specifically. Um, and then with Josh Jacobs, it's one of those same conversations. It's like, John Gruden, you said he's going to do whatever the hell he wants. It's like, yeah, he is because he's got a 10-year, $100 million <laughs> contract and he's not going to get fired. So he can do whatever he wants with no consequences, right? He's not worried about winning games or whatever. I know he wants to, but he's going about it the wrong way. So I think, yeah, we're going to see Kenyon Drake way more involved in this offense than we should. James, uh, Josh Jacobs, excuse me, is going to be fine. He's going to be a safe, low-end RB2. He's going to get volume on the ground. But as far as the upside that could be there with Josh Jacobs, he could be a top 10 fantasy football running back if he just got the work through the air that he deserves, and that's just not going to happen. All right, Derek, let's talk about your wide receivers that you are lower on than the expert consensus ranking. And uh, let's start with uh, somebody in Denver. Yeah, I mean, look, the, we're talking about just the, the sweeping ideas about how these offenses are going to run. And Cortland Sutton is a guy that I think that, one, people remember him a lot more glowingly than what his actual fantasy production was, even in the breakout season. I mean, he's wide receiver 27 in fantasy points per game. And we talk about him, or you hear him discuss, like he was a top 15, top 20 wide receiver when he was immensely awesome on the field. And he was the only guy in the passing attack. I think, again, we're getting back to this. Denver is going to run the ball, and they got enough passing options where Carlton Sutton's not needed for this 25% target share. Now, are targets earned? Sure. Is Cortland Sutton a really good talent? Sure. This is also a Denver team that we saw in neutral and positive game scripts. They were top six, top six in rushing rate. So they're going to run the ball. Defense is better. I, I, I just can't rank Cortland Sutton that high this year. Yates, what are your thoughts on Cortland Sutton? Because I feel like people do think about him so glowingly because he was actually a value a few years ago. He gave you that really good season, that breakout at a value, right. but now it's at a cost. So how does that change the dynamic? Yeah, it's a completely different offense from what we saw a couple of years ago with Cortland Sutton, where you got Jerry Judy, you've got KJ Hamler, I mean, Tim Patrick, you've got Noah Fant, Albert Okwebenam, Devontae Williams, Melvin Gordon. Like, you just like to show off and say that name. You know, you're the only <laughs> guy in the industry I don't actually don't say think that I'm name. saying it the right way. Like, I, you know I say that fully confidently. I don't think confidence. I'm saying it the right way. But, but at this point... 
I'm so far into just saying this Listen, this man, way that I'm just going to ride it out. You say it with such beauty and confidence that <laughs> I, I don't know. Like, I mean, I don't know what else to say about it. And literally any chance he gets when he talks about the Broncos, Derek, he has to drop that name and it's stunning. Go ahead, <laughs> Yates. Uh, there are too many mouths to feed in this offense. <laughs> like, the, if you have one of these guys that kind of that is going to miss time with an injury, then sure, I can see it. But Cortland Sutton, I mean, I talked about him in that range where you know you got Kenny Galladay in ADP and stuff like that in that range in that cluster. I, I'm not taking Cortland Sutton there just because I think that Jerry Judy can command the target share, uh, at least to be the one a in this, in this uh, wide receiver court. And then what happens like Cortland Sutton, he's going to be a fine wide receiver three that you're going to have to live with some big performances and some low performances here or there. I get it. I get why you're lower than the ECR. All right. Another wide receiver on your list, Derek, that you are lower on than ECR. I, I, I don't know if people kind of like marry all these things together. Like when they look at all these players and they, they, they go to the offense and they say, all right, well, we got George Kittle as a top three tight end. Um, and now we have Debo Samuel as a top 30, top 36 wide receiver. We're high on the rushing attack. We believe in all these things. And then we have Brandon Ayuk as a top 24 wide receiver. Like, which one of these options busts? Because I don't think we see the passing volume, unless we're just talking about massive touchdown equity out of this offense. Are we going to see the passing volume to support all of these different options that everybody's like, oh, I love this, I love this, I love this, I love this, but I hate the quarterback position, but but I love Trey Lance, but is Trey Lance going to be the full-time starter? Are they going to run two-quarterback system? Is this going to be a mess, and it's going to be great for the 49ers and horrible for us in fantasy outside of maybe George Kittle? I, I can't push the button on Brandon Ayuk as a top 24 wide receiver. As a wide receiver three, that's fine, but... I, Somebody out of this offense, somebody in this passing attack has got a bust because I don't see it outside of immense efficiency that there's going to be the volume to sustain three top, like, where basically everybody's being drafted and all these options. Yeah, it's also some really good points. What are your thoughts here about San Francisco and this offense and Ayuk? I just had a really good conversation with Brett Coleman on the uh, Fantasy Pros Dynasty Football Podcast about this offense, and he is very high on Brandon Ayuk, and he's coming at it from a film perspective. He's saying the X receiver in this offense always produces, and I pushed back and said, okay, well, what have these offenses where you had guys like Andre Johnson, he brought up Julio Jones, like, and, and just massive, massive production from these guys. Have they had a tight end in this offense like George Kittle that commands the target share that he does? And the answer is no, because there's very few tight ends in NFL history like George Kittle. And so that is the concern, right? Is if Kittle plays all 17 games, he's going to command, he's going to be the number one target on, on this offense. Like it's just a guarantee. And then what happens? What's the trickle down effect to the rest of these guys where if Trey Lance does take over, the passing attempts are going to come crashing down because Kyle Shanahan wants to run the football. And guess what? They're going to be able to do it really, really well. So I think Brandon Ayuk, you said as a wide receiver three, I absolutely agree with that. I think he does have the upside and the talent to produce. I'm lower on Debo Samuel than a lot of people because I think he's the odd yes, man out yeah. in this situation. So Brandon Ayuk as a wide receiver three, I can live with the potential range of outcomes. Drafting him as a wide receiver too, risky him to play. Yeah, I agree it's, with that. It's Simmons. craziness because Debo is being drafted as a top 32 wide receiver in best ball. And people are, they're like, okay, Jeez. Brandon Ayuk's a wide receiver too. Debo Samuel is a high end. He's a mid wide receiver three. Like, I'm like, what are we doing here? <laughs> right. All right, we got two more players on the list to talk about. So give me the last wide receiver in this grouping that you're lower on, Debro. It's got to be Adam Thielen. I think that, that Minnesota, again, is going to go back to running the ball. Their defense is going to be improved, and a lot of this comes down to touchdown production. Now, the reports of Irv Smith, if he misses the entire season, could that change how I view this passing offense? Sure. But Adam Thielen's touchdown production was absolutely ridiculous last year. How efficient he was. You had 20 wide receivers with nine or more end zone targets. The only two NFL wide receivers that converted their end zone targets into touchdowns at a higher rate than Mr. Thielen were Devontae Adams and Tyler Lockett. So I don't put Adam Thielen in that same type of tier as far as talent. I like the player, but I think the touchdowns are going to regress a little bit. I think this offense is going to run more because the defense is going to be better. So I, I'm i a little bit lower on Adam Thielen than consensus. Yates, I feel like we've been kind of leery of him also this offseason. Are you still in that same way about Adam Thielen? 
Yeah, he's one of those guys that you're betting on the chemistry with Kirk Cousins for him to finish where he's going in drafts. Uh, because there is, if he doesn't have the same touchdown rate as he did last year, he's going to finish way outside of the top 24 wide receivers. Based on expected touchdown rate last year, Thielen should have had only five and a half receiving touchdowns on his 925 receiving yards. He finished with 14. So we that is a massive, massive like target for regression here. Uh, for Adam Thielen. So you're taking a massive leap of faith. There's the there's the chemistry with Kirk Cousins. So it absolutely can't happen. And Thielen is still a very, very talented and productive wide receiver. But to draft him at, you know, I think he's going wide receiver 20 or something like that, you're betting on that happening. And that's just a game that it's risky. It's risky. All right, last guy. Who's the quarterback that you are lower on than the experts? Mr. Aaron Rodgers. I still have him as a QB1, but I don't have him ranked. Right now at ECR, he's QB7. And again, we're talking about touchdown regression. Aaron Rodgers just finished with the second highest passing touchdown rate of any quarterback with 100 or more passing attempts in the last 10 years. <laughs> if that doesn't scream regression to everybody listening to this, and I'm in your ear holes right now, he is going to have less passing touchdowns this year based off of just simple regression. Much less if you look at LaFleur's offense, if he goes back to higher red zone rushing rates, then the touchdowns are going to go down for Aaron Rodgers and they're just going to filter to the running backs. So I, I, I think Rodgers is a top 12 quarterback. But at top eight, top seven, I've seen some people rank him in the top five or six. I, I can't. I just can't. Yates, yeah, I like Aaron Rodgers as a, a good super flex value, but as a single quarterback, we go back to that same discussion at tight end, which is, are you getting quarterbacks or tight ends that move the needle, or are you not? And if you're not, then why not just wait on it? So what are your thoughts on Aaron Rodgers? Yeah, with Rodgers, I've got him at, I'm pulling it up right now. I've got him at seven. Me too. So it's, for me, I can't rank him behind Justin Herbert because I've got concern, my own concerns about Herbert and transitioning to a, a different OC. Mm -hmm. Ryan Tannehill, I think just the limited passing volume. If we see, if I'm projecting the passing volume to increase, then yes, he would be above Aaron Rodgers. But the situation is the same for Aaron Rodgers this year, right? It's not like he's changing offenses. It's not like he's having a high turnover as far as receiving options. You need Devontae Adams to be healthy in order for him to finish in that range, but it's still Aaron freaking Rodgers. Like, it's still, he has the potential to absolutely finish with 40 plus passing touchdowns again and less than five interceptions. So, he's one of those guys that I can't rank above Russell Wilson, Dak Prescott, Lamar Jackson, can't get there. But as a safe, steady option, I like him. But again, it's kind of that comes back to where I've got him ranked and then where I'm willing to take him. And he's in that range of guys in the quarterback position where in round seven, round eight, I'm not willing to take a quarterback there because I'm willing to wait on a guy like maybe a Ryan Tannehill, get the val and play the value game for or Matthew Stafford and then pair him with a Trey Lance or something like that. That's just a difference in philosophy. I think Aaron Rodgers is still a fine quarterback to draft where he's going, but he's not one that I'm personally taking because I like the value later on in the board. Some great discussion points there, and it's time to discuss now your listener questions. Let's go to the Twitter machine at Dano Billingsley. Dano wants to know who is your ride or die player this year? Obviously, if you get them at a good value, yeah, it's who's your ride or die guy. I mean, it's got to be Trey Lance, right? I mean, you've got all the Lance you could possibly There's a imagine. Few. <laughs> There's a few guys that uh, people are sick of hearing me talk about. So I think, yeah, the three that I'll throw out Trey Lance, Robert Woods, Johnny Smith. All right. How about you, D bro? Who, who get, who's on all of your teams this year? Uh, I've got a lot of Jalen Hurts. I've also got uh, a lot of parts or pieces of the Jets rushing attack. So it's Michael Carter, Mason cool. Ty Johnson at the very, very end of draft. I hope you have a whole bottle of whiskey that went I was about to say, that's got to feel good. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're going to surprise some people. That offensive line is going to surprise some people in run blocking. And I the think other how quickly that... you go through that whiskey bottle is going to surprise you. <laughs> <laughs> it might. It might. And the other guy I'm betting on talent, and I, I think he's going to explode because the efficiency metrics say that he, he has the upside to do that. I've got a ton of Chase Claypool this year. All yeah. right. Is there a player, and this is from Steve M. at Trader Tennessee, running back or wide receiver outside the top 200 this year that will be a fantasy starter going into the 2021, uh, 22 season? Excuse me. Oh, man. I don't even have the player top outside the top up, so. 200. I, I can throw you out some names here uh, because the 200, I mean, that's, that's, we're getting really deep. These are those deeper names, those deeper leagues. So I. Uh, I don't know I've, got a I've got a couple. I've got a couple in there. I've got. Okay. A, I pulled it up. Uh, Gabriel Davis, that Buffalo was, that Bills wide receiver. That was where I was going. Um, yeah, and then the other one again. I'll throw a dart. Uh, Tony Jones Jr. 
I think he's got this RB2 job locked up in New Orleans. All right, let's get to another question. We'll try to get everybody happier as much as we possibly can. Uh, MD at Big Dales and Bro. Another bro, just like you, D-Bro. Uh, in a draft with 8 to 10 people, is it smartest to get the best at positions since depth can be added post-draft weekly, or do you employ still taking running back early and waiting on quarterback and tight end? D-Bro, what are your thoughts on this when you draft with 8 to 10 in the smaller leagues? It's funny because I actually just wrote this up over at FTM Fantasy, how you attack 10-team leagues versus 12-team leagues. And for me, these onesie positions, like where you're going the the elite of the elite, I want somebody like I am going to pay up for the elite tight end in every single facet of 8 or 10-team leagues because you could trade for the depth. And I want to pay up not necessarily for the Patrick Mahomes ilk, but like players that I think could be a top five quarterback, like going that are a little bit later, like say Dak Prescott, Russell Wilson, the end of that tier that still could finish top two at the quarterback position. Yes, those onesie positions, I'm going to pay up for in the smaller leagues. Yeah, uh, I agree. Also, in the smaller leagues, it's easier for replacement value if those guys get hurt. Mm-hmm. The deeper the right. league, the more difficult that becomes. If you have a big investment in Darren Waller or George Kittle, they get hurt. It's going to be ugly in a 14-team league trying to replace that from a roster construction standpoint. Right. Don't forget about that. And don't forget to follow our guest on the Twitter machine, at dbro underscore ffb. Check out all his work at FTN Network. He's the uh, DFS writer guy for them, too. Does great content. Hopefully, he'll he'll grace us with an appearance in season in a DFS show. And, you know, Derek, again, so happy to see you out here kicking butt in the industry. You know, and all those great stats and great takes and everything you got, I just hope you can come out of your shell at some point. The more that you work in this industry and, and just, you know, just let the passion come out a little bit more for how you feel. But tell everybody what you got going on in the meantime. Yeah, so uh, thank you all again for having me. This is awesome. And yes, uh, we, we're going to have to spit some DFS fire in season. Um, I just got out of preseason mode, so that grind is real and it's crazy it's going gross. through wide receiver. Say what it is. 12s. It's gross. <laughs> it's 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 um it's a grind, uh, but it's awesome, man. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm we're firing up. We're all getting ready for week one. Uh, I am happy to announce like at FTN Network, I'm going to be doing our game by game breakdown every single week. Uh, so whether it's you're playing showdown, whether you're playing uh, the main slates, cash, all these types of things, I'm going to be doing the game by game breakdown for FTN Network. So check me out there uh, for all my DFS work. And I'm going to have dynasty work and redraft stuff coming out weekly every single week. And as well as the po- the podcast, Fade the Chalk, uh, my co-host Adam Pfeiffer. We're rocking like three, four episodes a week. Uh, it's It's here, boys. Like we're ready for kickoff. We're primed. Great stuff, Derek. As always, we appreciate the time and the knowledge. And I want to remind everybody, do not go into a draft this week or this weekend without the draft assistant with Sync. You can only get it at fantasypros.com slash draft wizard. And you can only get the draft assistant with Sync with an MVP or Hall of Fame subscription, which you can get at fantasypros.com slash offers. Make a $10 deposit on one of our partner sites. That's Underdog, FanDuel, DK, Yahoo, Daily Fantasy. Enter a contest. You get six free months of the Hall of Fame package. That's a $65 value. Boom. That's how you get the draft assistant. And I just became John Madden in that read. I also want to remind everybody too, don't forget about our sponsors of the show. If you're still looking to set up a league, go to Fantrax to do it. Fantrax is the home of fantasy sports with the most customizable options out there. Go to Fantrax.com slash fantasy pros to sign up today and get yourself something nice. It's $5 credit on us. Go to Pristine Auction. Use the promo code fantasy pros. Again, that's Pristine Auction, P-R-I-S-T-I-N-E auction.com. That'll do it for us, but the story of the game goes on. For Derek Brown and Kyle Yates, I'm Joey P. We'll see you next time, kids. Thanks for tuning in to the Fantasy Pros YouTube channel. Don't forget to check out our featured videos. And while you're at it, make sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Fantasy Pros so you can get the latest news and updates to give you the edge you need in your fantasy league.